23,000 miles of navigable rivers, 23,000 miles along the Ohio and the Allegheny, the Monongahela and the Kanawha, the Kentucky and the Cumberland, the Tennessee, the Black Warrior, the Tom Bigby, the Columbia and the Mississippi, 23,000 miles of waterways, a distance almost equal that around the earth. On these rivers are born America's inland merchant marine, river boats with cargoes bound for the teeming cities of our great industrial centers. For the far distant shores were stand embattled allies, river boats bearing grain from the ever normal granaries of the West, coal from the bituminous fields of Illinois, Indiana, West Virginia, cotton from the South, pig iron from Birmingham to St. Louis, guns from Louisville's naval gun plant to ships on the Gulf of Mexico. Since 1900, more than 40 rivers have been improved by canalization, opening their upper reaches to navigation. The first lock on the Mississippi at Keokuk is 1,400 miles from the sea. The first lock on the Tennessee is 1,300 miles. From Fort Benton, Montana on the Missouri to the Gulf is 3,500 miles. 3,500 miles of open navigation connecting inland America with the seaports of the south and west and east, connecting the riverboat with the traffic of the seven seas. The complicated system of locks and dams ensures a navigable channel the year round. It has made possible the use of huge barges and powerful twin screw oil burning tugs. Today, the port of Louisville, 500 miles from salt water, handles some of the biggest cargoes known to shipping circles. In the present emergency, the inland merchant marine is proving one of America's biggest assets. This vast fleet is moving iron, steel, oil, lumber, gravel, stone, cement, moving it in ever-increasing volume through Louisville, Cincinnati, Evansville, St. Louis, to ports on the Mississippi and the Tennessee, to the Texas Intracoastal Canal, where it spreads out by truck, rail, and freighter to the four corners of the globe. Today, the river has again come into its own as a major transportation system. Not in a century and a half has it been as busy as it is today. And the riverboat, a favorite of romantic fiction, carries the raw materials and the manufactured products vital to a nation in the grip of total war. churches and lives, blasted in a hurricane of destruction from the air. Here the embattled people of a great nation stand, consecrated to the defense of democracy for all the world. These are our allies. From them has come the urgent plea, you give us the tools, we'll do the rest. Foremost among England's needs is food for freedom. Food from America, pledged in ever-increasing quantities. Through the shattered ruins of what was once the greatest city in the world, roll the Blitz kitchens carrying American food for victory. Here in America, we are learning the importance of food for defense. Balanced diets create more productive man hours of work. Vitamin-bearing foods bring health insurance to our men in uniform. Today we are reaping the harvest of years of careful planning. In our fertile valleys and fruitful plains, we are setting up a new first line of defense, a gigantic agricultural assembly line, which must produce America's defense weapon number one. More important than steel, more important than coal and oil, these familiar foods may well be the deciding factor in the outcome of the war. Mass agricultural production calls for an abundance of raw material. A vast reservoir of feed grains and forage, stored up over a period of years, 
by over six million farmers working together in the National Farm Program. The farmer-owned Ever Normal Granary Program is being expanded, expanded to feed America and her allies. Raw materials for agricultural production, the feed grains and forage must be processed by the farmer's machine tools for livestock, which converts raw materials into useful food products for human consumption. Equally important is the production, maintenance, and operation of farm equipment. In our all-out defense effort, these common machines rank with the tanks, trucks, and tractors of our new mechanized army. Here, then, is the American farmer's first job in defense. And the country's biggest defense industry is hard at it, providing food for freedom. Two million men for the world's greatest air force. Crushing air superiority for the United States. Two million men as against the 1,250,000 of the Nazi Luftwaffe. The one million of the RAF. From three giant pilot factories, breathtaking in their scope, come the young eagles. This single unit, Maxwell Field, sprawls across nine southern states, comprises 38 different schools, seven military establishments bound together to form the Southeast Air Corps Training Center. Across nine states flows a steady stream of students, stopping for a few weeks at each school to learn the things in which it specializes. Potential navigators, bombardiers, observers, classified for the combat crew replacement wing, they will emerge fully qualified fighting men. The factory force at Maxwell Field last year numbered 2,000 officers, 20,000 enlisted men, it's their job to make young eagles, prepare them to take their places in tactical units of combat commands, experts in spins, forced landings, formation flying. In the more advanced phases of his training, the young pilot is taught instrument flying. In the early stages, a link trainer is used. This machine approximates actual flying conditions. The student, once locked inside, experiences all the sensations of blind flying while instructors at the recording board can follow and check the course of his flight. During peacetime, the complete flight training course required one year. Without relinquishing high standards and with continued emphasis on quality of output, the course has been condensed to speed up the process for the present emergency. Uncle Sam means business, tremendous business. 185,000 warplanes are to be produced this year and next. Pilots, navigators, radio men, bombardiers, ground crews, 11 men are needed to man each plane. To achieve the great goal we have set for ourselves, some 41 primary, 18 basic and 21 advanced training schools and three flexible gunner schools, a total of 83, will be in operation throughout the South and Southern California, where all year training is possible. 80 dedicated to the single task of training young eagles two million of them, to darken the skies above the oppressors and cast a mighty shadow on the rising sun. We need the best Air Force in the world, and we're well on the way toward getting it.